All right, Gray Hat SSH or SSH for hackers and red teams. This talk is intended to be a bunch of practical examples of stuff you can do with SSH, uh, specifically that are kind of red teamy or hacker related. Uh, I wanna thank the Texas Cyber Summit and Red Team Village for hosting this awesome jungle event and for accepting my talk and letting me come and do this. Um, so let's get into it. Uh, first off, my name's Evan. I'm the director of offense at Randori. Uh, outside of doing red teaming and uh, offense uh, oriented engagements professionally, I'm also active in CCDC. I'm uh, one of the founding red team members for the national CCDC, as well as I am pretty avid CTFer. Uh, and uh, kind of into all of the puzzles and games and cool stuff you can do that are uh, attack related. Uh, my Twitter is uh, at syndrome and uh, come come check it out in the Randori channel. Uh, I'm gonna be in and out of there all day long. So come say hi and uh, yeah, that's me. Uh, so outline for the talk. Uh, first, we're gonna go over the basics cause I can't really explain a bunch of the command lines without covering some of what you see. Then we're gonna go over all of the fun stuff you can do with functionality that's just built into SSH. Then after that, we're gonna go over how you can customize SSH and trick users into doing some fun things for you. And in general, just what some of the config files are, where they live, how they work. Uh, and then finally, what probably most people are here for, we're gonna go through a few different scenarios where you can actually get plain text creds by tricking users into doing things that they are probably not intending to do or kind of taking advantage of just how the SSH process works. Uh, so right from the start, just what is SSH? Let's kind of start at the beginning. So SSH is actually secure shell. Um, it is both the daemon and the client. So there's an SSH service that runs on a server, SSHD. That would be the daemon side. And then the client, which is the command line utility or the GUI or some other uh, client side that speaks SSH that lets me connect to that server and do this functionality. Uh, the most common SSH that you're gonna run into is open SSH, but there's also drop bear, uh, win SSH. There's a bunch of different libraries that implement SSH. It's actually pretty common. Uh, SSH get, or originally SSH was intended to replace Telnet and RSH, which were both remote administration tools that were plain text. That's obviously problematic if you're connecting to something over the network in plain text. It's really easy to see what's going on uh, and steal passwords, sniff things, etc. <clears throat> Uh, so SSH is used to remotely administer systems. It's a, it's a replacement for Telnet and RSH. Uh, additionally, you can use, use SSH to upload and download files. Everything's encrypted, which is the goal, right? Make sure that we can securely administer these systems. And the way the SSH protocol was uh, implemented, there's a bunch of encrypted channels that you can open and close. And this allows additional functionality, such as port forwarding, X11 forwarding. And then of course, the, the full PTY shell that you get, that's exactly like you're running on the system console. You can do everything that you could do on the console, VI, sudo, control C, all that kind of stuff. And you don't have to worry about your session getting killed or anything like that. So uh, the next obvious question I hear people ask is, well, why is this useful for an attacker? Uh, I'm always going after anything that can be used to remotely administer systems. So anything an admin can do, I probably also want to do. So that remote shell access is huge. Uh, port forwarding here is super useful. Uh, we'll see some examples of how I can use that to get around network security controls. Downloading and uploading files is kind of obvious. And then the fact that the whole thing is encrypted, while it does protect administrators and uh, people wanting to access systems from getting their 
information sniffed. It also protects me from getting my information sniffed. So if I'm crossing some sort of boundary that I know is monitored, all of my communications are now encrypted, which makes it that much harder for defenders to be able to watch what I'm doing. Uh, this this uh, little meme here is kind of perfect. Uh, is it all you need? Well, I do need water and food. But other than that, if I can get access to SSH, I kind of have access to everything I need to do. Uh, I just want to call out here. So the SSH clients, right, that you're going to run into commonly are OpenSSH is the one you're going to run into in almost all of the Linuxes. Some of the smaller embedded systems use a thing called DropBear, and there are other uh, SSH kind of GUIs. And then for Windows, most of the time you're going to see what's called PuTTY, or which is the GUI, and then produced by the same people that make PuTTY is a command line tool called Plink that is very similar to the, SSH, the Linux SSH command line tool in that uh, a lot of these arguments, either the command lines are actually the same or it can do the same functionality that we'll be going over here. And then additionally, we're gonna go over some stuff that you can do with a Python project called Paramico, which is uh, a pure Python implementation of both the client and the server side of the SSH protocol. Uh, one thing to point out here is SSH is also great because it's really easy to enumerate. So in this top example, I'm just using a pretty simple netcat command to connect to the default SSH port. And I can see that that service is running SSH. It's the 2.0 version of the protocol. Uh, it is the open SSH server 8.3, and this is running on a Debian system. Since SSH is so simple to enumerate, there is all sorts of awesome scripts. Uh, and one of those that I'm showing an example here of is Nmap, where we're running the discovery scripts. You can see kind of the same information we got from Netcat, that there's a banner, all of the information for that. And then it's also going out and enumerating all of the different algorithms that SSH supports for doing the encryption, uh, compressing, etc. So that's kind of the what is SSH. Now let's go over some of the basics or how you use SSH. So the first example here is how I use SSH to just connect to a remote system. So let's say I have Bob's password and, or maybe I am Bob, but more likely I have Bob's password. Uh, so here, and, and Bob has an account on 10.10.10.10. So here I say, I would like to SSH from my local system to connect as Bob to 10.10.10.10. So that pretty straightforward SSH Bob at 10.10.10.10. And then I have a full shell and I can run who am I and you can see who I am. I can run any command that Bob has access to run. Uh, the next example here is me running a single command. So this is connecting out as Bob to that same server, running who am I, and then I'm just back on my local system. Now, why is that useful? Well, in the top example, if there's someone watching this system or logged into the system and they are watching who is logged in, for instance, there's a command called who, it will show you all of the users that are logged in, they're gonna see Bob log in. They're going to see the IP address that Bob logged in from. And they might say, hey, why is Bob logging in at 2 o'clock in the morning from some IP address in AWS? That doesn't seem right. Uh, and then they're going to catch me, and I'm going to be really sad. So one of the things I can do here, and this isn't foolproof, but it does make it a little bit harder. If I just run these one-off commands, then someone has to run that who command at the exact time that my commands are running or there are other commands they can watch like last and that kind of stuff. Um, but the real takeaway here is this doesn't just show up in who, and you don't, unless you're looking at it at the exact right time, you don't even see the net, in netstat, you can't even see that there is a, a connection established. So this is kind of a bit of a opsec thing you can do to make it a little bit harder for defenders to find you. Uh, next up, we have copying files. So there's all sorts of reasons why you would want to get a file onto a system or get a file off of a system. But here are just a couple real basic ones. So um, I'm going to use the utility called 
SCP. So this is secure copy. And I'm going to SCP from my system, the file called malware. And then I'm once again connecting as Bob to 10.10.10.10. And I'm gonna store that file in the super non-obvious, not malicious looking at all path of bin not malware. So I'm putting this in a folder that Bob probably runs executables out of, and you can tell it's totally not malware because that's what it says. In the next example from my local system, I want to copy a file from the uh, remote system that Bob has access to. And um, I, I, I didn't actually say this at the beginning, but the SCP syntax is SCP source and then destination. So in the first example, it's SCP source is the malware file on my local system. And then the destination is the bin not malware as Bob on 10.10.10.10. Um, here in the second, back to the second example, same thing, it's still source and destination. So I want to copy from the remote system to my system. So I want to copy from Bob at 10.10.10.10 Etsy secret sauce to my local system in loot secret. And then the other thing to point out here is that you can do this recursively. So say Etsy secret doesn't just have sauce, it has a bunch of different files in it that I wanna get all of them. I can do SCP minus R, Bob, and same thing, source and destination. So Bob at 10.10.10.10, .10 .10 .10, Etsy secret, and then copy it down into the loop folder. And there's actually two ways here to copy SSH that come kind of by default here. So I'm gonna go through the other example here, which is SFTP. So this is, just like the other one is uh, secure copy, this is secure FTP. So this is actually a different mechanism. If you get into the SSH protocol, uh, SFTP actually does this a little differently than what S SCP is doing. But um, kind of how you use this is you SFTP, Bob at 10.10.10.10, and then I want to get from slash secret sauce to slash loot secret sauce. So that is from the remote system to my local system. And then in the next example is uploading a file. So I'm going to put from artifacts on malware on my system to not malware, because that's totally secret and no one would ever catch that. And then just like in the previous example, if you want to do something recursively, uh, it's a little different. Like I said, these are SFTP and SCP are implemented a little differently. So the command line options are slightly different. This is dash capital R. Uh, I don't know why they didn't use the same. You'll actually notice that SSH has a bunch of command line options and SCP has a bunch of command line options and those don't all match up perfectly either, but um, just something to kind of keep an eye on. Uh, so, that is kind of the, or that is completely the basics. So you can log in and you can copy files. So now let's start looking at the fun stuff you can do with the different functionality that you have to uh, forward um, ports and various other things here with SSH. So I'm gonna start out here with the a really basic example here, but you kind of got to understand what's happening. So I am on my little laptop there on the left. I happen to know that the Bob's server of 10.10.10.10 .10 is on the perimeter of this organization called Canary Cannery. Now I can assume there's a bunch of servers inside there potentially. So I want to see what's actually going on uh, inside that network. So unfortunately there's a firewall that's blocking me. I can only see this one system but maybe from that system, I can see other things. So I wanna do what's called a local forward. So for instance, maybe I know inside that canary cannery, there's a system in there that's a web server and that there's some sort of cool secret on that web server that I would like to get access to. I am going to use SSH to set up a local port on my system. That's port 8080 on the left. I'm gonna tunnel that over SSH so it will send it over the SSH tunnel to that 10.10.10.10 .10 .10 .10 system. And the uh, 
request will then come out of that system, connect to that server on the inside, and look like from that system's point of view, look like it's coming from 10.10.10.10. So I am forwarding a port, a local port from my system to a port on the other side of that SSH box. What that looks like here is um, in the top, here's the syntax, so minus capital L, and then that bind address is optional, so we don't have to actually put that part, that's why that's in brackets like that. And then I want to put the local port that I'm going to use, the host I would like that local port to connect to, and the host port that I would like that to connect to. So that is going, or the uh, in the command line, that looks like SSH minus L, port 8080 for the local port on my system, 192.168.1.10, which is the IP address on the remote side, and then port 80, because that's the web server. And then I'm gonna do that as Bob at 10.10.10.10. Now one thing I wanna point out here is that dash capital N, that's telling my SSH client to not request a shell on that remote system. Just like before where I was running single commands so that someone wouldn't be able to just see me in the who output, this minus capital N doesn't request a shell, so you don't actually see that access. The only way you see this is by looking at the SSH logs or by looking at netstat and seeing that there's a weird connection to port 22. Uh, once I have established that connection, so for this example, I just kind of run it in the background with that ampersand, and now I can connect to port 8080 on my local system and make an HTTP request just with curl for this example and grab that secret.txt. And then as is kind of always uh, how it works for the red team, we win. Uh, that's super neat, right? That I can go to one system in there, right? I've bypassed a firewall, that's pretty great with kind of minimal effort. But I don't want to do that for each of these systems. There's all sorts of systems back behind there. I don't know what they are all doing. And if I have to set up this for every single port that happens, uh, I'm going to be sad and be typing quite a bit. So luckily, SSH has thought of that for us and given us this dynamic port forwarding feature. So I can set up with one SSH command on my system a SOX proxy, which is a SOX is just a uh, TCP forwarding protocol. So I can set that up so that on my system there is a port. I use 1080 generally because that's kind of the default SOX proxy port. Uh, and I can set that up, tunnel that just like the local forward did through that SSH tunnel over that SSH server and then connect out to any of the systems that are on the other side of that SSH server. So I'm going from, if I connect to this 1080 with something that knows how to speak the SOX protocol, all of my connections actually wind up coming out over here and I could connect to all of these different servers on their TCP ports uh, and browse whatever they have. So for instance, a lot of times when I'm doing engagements against an organization and I don't know anything about that organization, I'm gonna be looking for wikis or uh, other sources of information about that org so I can figure out what their password schemes are and all that kind of stuff. So it's really useful for me to be able to, instead of just running curl, maybe point a browser at one of these web servers and get access to the information that is on the other side of there. So what does that look like? From the command line, it's actually easier than the other thing that I was doing and that I just need to use minus D. So dynamic, right? And then same thing, the bind address is optional. I don't actually have to say that. And then the port that I wanna open up on my system and then tell it where I'm connecting to. So this is uh, SSH minus D, 1080 is the port. Like I said, that's a pretty common SOX proxy port. And then Bob at 10.10.10.10. Uh, and then on my system, I will see 1080 as a port that is open. And uh, say I want to use my browser. So this is an example of how you would configure Firefox to use a proxy like that. Uh, Chrome is can also, pretty much any web browser can use proxies like this. But for Firefox, just for simplicity, uh, you can go to Preferences, Network Settings, 
uh, and then you select manual proxy conf configuration here, and then you tell it, hey, this is a SOX proxy, this is the port there, it's on my local host, and this is on uh, 1080. And then just the default here is SOX 5, I leave it at this. SSH can actually do SOX 4 and SOX 5, uh, but SOX 5 is kind of the newer and does some cool stuff for you like DNS resolution and that kind of stuff. Um, so now, once this configuration is set, anything I try to go to in this browser will actually go through this system here and come out, or sorry, this system here and come out over here so that you can see that traffic and get access to all of these systems that are here behind this firewall. So I've used this dynamic forwarding to actually get past all of this uh, firewall stuff and essentially hop that boundary into this network, which is uh, obviously uh, pretty useful, hopefully. Uh, and then, so that's cool. I have a browser doing it, but maybe I have all sorts of other tools that I want to be able to do, like, um, I don't know, something with Metasploit or some sort of craziness. Um, one of the other things that you can do here is there are a few different tools, but I like to use this proxy chains tool. It's pretty easy to configure. So proxy chains has a configuration file, same thing here. Uh, there's a proxy list. I just tell it, hey, do SOX5 to localhost at 1080. And then I can uh, here run proxy chains bash. Now that's gonna drop me into an interactive bash shell. And then anything I do in that bash shell will also be sent out over that proxy. So I can use curl, I can use my netcat, anything that's gonna talk TCP. Uh, you can do proxy chains and just individual commands, but I find I actually like to just have a shell that's just everything's forwarded. Uh, proxy chains is doing that by kind of hijacking the networking of any of the protocol or any of the binaries that run and uh, injecting the proxy part of that to speak to that um, proxy for you. So if you do have something that's like a statically compiled binary, it's probably not gonna work. But for most things, this will work out pretty good. So that's local uh, forwarding and dynamic port forwarding. Uh, that's pretty neat, but maybe say I need to get outside. So let's say this time I'm actually inside of Canary Cannery, maybe uh, I fished someone and I have access to this server here on the right and they have really good egress filtering so I can't actually get to the internet and I'm just completely blocked here. Um, but I can get to this 10.10.10 box where I have SSH access. So I wanna download a file say on this system that I have compromised, uh, but I don't wanna just copy it up to the SSH server and then have it like on the file system so somebody else can find it or get caught in the middle of doing it. I just want this all to happen in one shot. So now I can do what's called a remote port forward. So from me on my box, I will set up where um, port 8080 on this SSH box actually forwards instead of this way, forwards this way. So if you go to port 8080 here, it actually comes and hits my box on port 8080. So anything that hits this can now hit my system. And then once again, I'll be bypassing those that firewall, uh, this time for the egress. So what does that look like? Well, uh, thankfully SSH makes it kind of obvious for us. There's a minus R for remote. Um, and then same thing, bind address is optional. I can give it here port, host, and then host port. Uh, one thing to point out here is most SSH servers, modern SSH servers, are going to have this, it's called gateway ports, disabled by default. So this will say no in the config file. And all you have to do is change this to yes and then restart SSH. Uh, the nice thing about SSH when you restart it is, is it doesn't kill your existing SSH uh, processes. So if you're logged in via SSH, you can still restart the SSH server. Um, but that lets you bind to what's called uh, the any address, which is 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0. So that makes it look like port 80, or it doesn't make it look like it just actually is. Port 8080 is open on 
that server, just like it's running a service on that server, instead it's port forwarded through to your laptop now. So uh, here in the example, I now just set this up. So I say SSH minus capital R, port 8080. I wanna to bind to that any address. And then it's also port 8080 on the remote system that I wanna open up. And then it is Bob at 10.10.10.10. I use that same minus N argument so that I don't actually request a shell. Once again, just don't wanna make it easy for defenders to find me. And then I set that into the background. Uh, for this example, I just start a simple HTTP server because I just want to serve a file from my local system. And then on the remote system, so if you remember, let me go back one here. So this is the remote system now. If I run that curl command, it's going to hit here and then hit my laptop. So you can see here, curl 10.10.10.10 is that remote system. And then I hit that port 8080. I grab the secret and then once again, uh, we get to win, which is pretty awesome. So that is uh, local, dynamic, and remote port forwarding. Kind of anything you want to do with TCP ports, you can make up here. So you can combine these in all sorts of different and interesting combinations. Um, and it is super useful to be able to get around firewalls, hop through networks. You can actually uh, local forward across multiple systems as long as you align all the ports right and get everything pointed in the right direction. So you could actually hop through multiple different firewalls if you wanted to proxy them all together all the way through. Uh, the other type of, one of the other type of forwardings that you can do here is what's called X11 forwarding. So X11 is what the graphical interface is called on a Unix system. Uh, there are two command line options you can do this with in SSH. There's minus X and minus Y. Uh, minus Y is the secure version. Minus X is kind of an older version. Um, at any rate, they work almost exactly the same from a user point of view. But what you can do here is I can run a process on the remote system. And if it has a GUI component, it will actually show up on my Linux box. Uh, you can do this with uh, on Mac OS. You can install what's called XQuartz. On Windows, there's a couple of different tools you can install that are uh, X11 servers. You have to have your own X11 server running locally. And then once you do this SSH minus X, that tells it to forward any of that GUI component back to your system. Here in the, the example, just for kind of simplicity and to put it on a slide, I launched this uh, Xize tool. So this is a little GUI tool that you can launch in Unix systems. And if this was actually live, you would see the, the pupils follow my cursor around here. Um, but why this is useful, there's a couple different uh, use cases for this that are um, actually really, really useful. The first is say that I know that Bob logs into this system and uses the GUI components on the system to do something like browse internal network resources or something that I don't generally have access to. Uh, if I have access to a shell on this system as Bob and I do this X11 forwarding, I can forward back any of those graphical interfaces to me with the process running on the remote system. So say for instance, it's a web browser and Bob I know is logged in and stores his cookies to access an internal wiki page or the internal Git repo or whatever um, internal system that Bob is storing his credentials for. I can launch that browser as Bob and have it come back to me. And if that browser is storing those credentials, then I can just use that browser like I am logged in as Bob. Uh, another thing you can do with this that's kind of fun is you can launch something like Xterm or Gnome Terminal or any of those. And then you have, once again, instead of just the SSH session, you have like a full Gnome Terminal running on your X11 server. So it's a little bit harder and more confusing for defenders to figure out what's going on because you have... Uh, essentially like the graphic component of that SSH or that uh, shell running in your local system, which is uh, pretty fun and 
uh, can be a cool way to keep access to a system when they're killing all of the, the shells and stuff that you have on the system. Uh, so that is the forwarding stuff that I have. Uh, up next, we're going to take a look at um, some fun that you can have with the config files that uh, work for SSH. So like most Unix systems, there are a bunch of different config files that can do all sorts of craziness, craziness with SSH. And it's uh, a little more interesting because there is a server and a client side component to this. So there are configurations that can change the way the server works and configuration files that can change the way the client works. Uh, the first thing I want to take a look at here is uh, what's called authorized keys. So SSH has two ways that you that it can authenticate users. One is through a username and password. So you SSH and then you type in your password. The other is uh, public and private key. So on my local system, I generate a, a, a public and private key. So here as root, which is not the best uh, example, but you know, uh, I run this command called SSH key gen, and that's going to generate the public and private key pair for me and put them in my home directory. If I put the public side of that SSH key into the authorized keys file on the remote system, then during the SSH negotiation, when it's trying to figure out if I'm allowed to log in or not, uh, the it's this is like a really dumbed down version of this, but the, the client side says, hey, I have this secret. And the server says, I don't believe you, encrypt this with it. And you say, okay, or the client says, okay, encrypts it and sends it back. And then the server decrypts it with the public key and says, okay, cool, that's you, you did it right. And lets you log in, no password necessary. Uh, this is very useful for a bunch of reasons. So say I am on the remote system as Bob because I fished Bob or I got access to a web server that has a vulnerability in it or uh, maybe Bob just ran a command for me that has my malicious payload in it and I want to get access to the system in a more full manner. I can put a put an SSH key in this authorized keys file, and then I don't even need to know Bob's password to log in. As long as I can control that authorized keys file, I can get in. Additionally, if you were wanting to persist, say someone is watching you do this and is like, hey, Bob's account is compromised and changes his password. Once again, if you have that authorized keys file, you don't actually need Bob's password to log in. Uh, this is very useful for CTFs and challenge type games where you get shell access to someone and you want to escalate that shell and then try to find other privileges. And this is also just super useful in general. If there's any way I can get access to that SSH authorized keys, then uh, I can get access to that remote system without having to really change anything or know anybody's password. Uh, the other thing to point out here is there is an authorized keys file that is global, which is in Etsy SSH. So uh, you can actually set up authorized keys that let you log in as any user or as individual users. Um, and they're in a couple different places. So it's a little bit harder to track down what's going on. Uh, the next file here that is very interesting is the known hosts file. So Kind of once again, there's uh, it's kind of an overarching how they, they implement stuff in SSH. There's a global file, which applies to everybody, and then a local file that is just for that user. So once I have access to a system, I can look at these known hosts files. And what they are is they're lists of all of the public key keys for systems that have been logged into from this system. So... Uh, I get access to the system as Bob. I only know about that one system. So now I can go and look through these known host files and see the other systems that Bob has access to log into. Now, if I know Bob's password or if, uh, and Bob is reusing passwords, which we know is bad, but happens all the time still. Or if Bob has that 
uh, public private key stuff set up and I can get access to that private key. Now I can log into any of the systems that Bob is logged into. And this is just a list of those systems for me. So really good uh, situational awareness for when I get access to a system and I'm trying to figure out what other systems I have access to. I can just go and look at this file and then I don't even have to try his credentials on a bunch of different systems and uh, uh, make a bunch of log files that say uh, login failed and all that kind of stuff. I can just go log into the systems that he has access to log into and it doesn't even look weird from this point because now I'm just logging in as him from a system that he has logged into before. Uh, and that is known hosts. There's one thing to point out. Uh, a lot of modern systems actually have uh, this so that the IP address is hashed. You can actually turn that off though. So in Etsy SSH SSH config, there is an option to turn that off. Uh, so let's talk about SSH SSH config a little bit. Um, this lets us tell SSH the command line what to do. So there's kind of two file structures here. There's Etsy SSH SSH config, and then you'll actually see Etsy SSH SSHD config. SSHD is for the daemon, and SSH config is for the command line argument. Most of the time, you're going to see SSHD and SSH, just the client, installed side by side, so that can be a little confusing. Um, it lets us do a bunch of cool things so we can configure all sorts of stuff with the SSH config, both for us to not have to type stuff a lot. And if you want to do interesting things for the user or really kind of trick the user into do interesting things for you. Uh, once again, there's a global version of this, which is Etsy SSH SSH config. And then there's the user version of this, which is the dot SSH config. Uh, so, Obvious question here, what are some of the things, some of those cool things that you can do with SSH? So let's kind of start with um, a, a, a simple version here, or really like this is how you'll see this used a lot. So maybe I now want to call that host name 10.10.10, .10 just bounce. So I'm going to say, hey, this host is bounce. And I want to log in as the user Bob. The host name, like I said, is 10.10.10.10. .10 .10 .10. I want to do a local forward of 10.80 to 192, 168, 1080. I want to do a dynamic forward. So these are all forwards that we saw before of 1080. And I want to do a remote forward of 8080 to 192, 168, uh, 1.10 on 8080. So, uh, if I just did SSH bounce, now it would go through and look up all of these configs and just do all of this for me. So all I have to type is SSH bounce and I don't have to type in any of those command line options or any of that. This, the SSH will just figure out that that's actually what I wanted to do. It's kind of neat, right? Less typing, but that's not really, uh, really all that useful for getting more access to stuff, is it? No. So let's use SSH config to do something cool. Let's say that I know someone is going to log in or Bob is going to log into this SSH server or from SSH server to another system on that, on that Canary Cannery network. Um, I want to use the SSH config. And what I can do here is configure it such that other commands get run when Bob runs SSH to connect to that system in uh, Canary Cannery. So what that would look like here is when he SSH is out, then I run another command to give me a shell that connects back to me. And now I have a shell as Bob on the 10.10.10 .10 server. Say I lost access to the system. They decided to remove the uh, authorized keys. Maybe they miss that I have this set up in the SSH config for Bob. Uh, and once again, you can put it in either the user's config or the global config. So as long as I have that 4141 listener set up on my box, whenever Bob SSHs out to that other system, I get a shell from his original system. And how I would do that in the SSH config is pretty straightforward. 
Uh, here I'm doing it for any of the systems that Bob tries to log into. Uh, the first thing I have to do it is to, I, I don't know why this is set up like this, but you have to set, uh, permit it to run local commands, which is also a configuration. Uh, and then the local command that I would like to run is just a, a netcat minus E for bin bash. Um, and to my listener IP on 4141, and then I background that, so it's just going. Um, in Bob's worldview, he SSHs to any of his systems, doesn't see anything else happen, and then I get a netcat listener that has spawned and connected back to me. Uh, so that's actually pretty useful. Uh, another very useful config file here is what's called the RC file. Um, this, there's a global, which is Etsy SSH SSHRC, or there's the user version, with it, which is .sshrc. And this runs a command on the system when, uh, right before it drops to shell as the user. So when I log into a remote system with SSH, this command runs on that remote system and gives me a shell, or uh, runs the commands and then drops to a shell for the user. So what I wanna do is use this to spawn a shell. So what that looks like here is same thing, say Bob is logging into this system here on the top and I've had access to that system on the top. I set up that RC file such that whenever Bob logs in, it's gonna spawn a netcat shell back to me on my listener and I don't have to do anything. It actually gets triggered when Bob logs in. Uh, and that is also a pretty simple uh, Thing to accomplish and that looks like this. So in the .ssh for whatever user, I just specify the command that I want to run and then at the end I ampersand it. So when Bob uh, SSHs via the blue line to that top server, then uh, before Bob gets his shell, but blind to Bob, a shell gets spawned back to me as Bob and then it drops into uh, Bob's environment. So those are some of the cool things you can do with the config files. There's a bunch of other stuff you can do. I uh, always recommend going and checking out the man pages and playing around with it. Uh, but let's get into kind of the fun here. So how would I steal creds? So now I am, there's a couple different things that I wanna steal creds from. Let's say up first, I know that Bob is SSHing to other systems in the network. I just wanna know what his password is. Maybe I don't even wanna spawn any more shells. I don't have access to any of this, those systems. He doesn't have SSH keys set up, anything like that. I just need to get what Bob's password is when he's doing this. And there's actually a pretty fun way that I have uh, done this in the past and it uh, works surprisingly well, which is I'm just gonna make a little shell script. So. This is kind of a, probably the most basic version of this. This is really just so I could fit this on the slide, but this actually would work if you wanted to do this. So um, where I'm putting this in user local bin because I happen to know from the way Bob's environment is set up that this comes before user bin in his path. So I make a file that's just called user local bin SSH. I'm just gonna go through this line by line real quick. So after the shebang, the first thing I'm gonna do is when someone runs this is prompt them for the first argument to this file and then say password and um, try to get that password. And whatever they give me, I'm gonna take the first argument and that password and echo it just into a file called temp.creds because it's super secret and then drop a new line and then just rerun it with the original SSH command. Uh, and what this looks like to the user is uh, Bob is going to try to SSH out to the remote system and then he's just gonna get prompted twice. So, hey Bob, what's your password? Nope, what's your password? And it's gonna look exactly the same to Bob. So you'll see, hey, welcome to whatever system he's logged in. And now if we were to exit that, then we can see in temp.creds we have Bob's password. So it's a pretty simple way, but super effective to steal the credentials for plain text credentials for a user. I don't have to crack anything or do anything crazy. Um, and uh, depending on how they have their path set up and all of that stuff that's going on, then just get, get plain text creds. And that's kind of always the goal. 
So the other, the other, the next scenario here that I want to go over is how do I get creds when I know someone's logging into a system that I have full access to? So once I have full access to a system, you can't trust any of the processes or anything that's going on here. So this is one example of when I know someone is SSHing into the system that I'm on, I can use debugging tools. So here in this example, I'm going to go ahead and find the process for SSHD. And then I'm going to do what's called strace, which looks for all of the, um, the syscalls that happen in that binary and just spits out what they are. I'm going to filter on the strace because I happen just from knowing how the SSH protocol works. I'm looking for reads. So it's reading the password from whoever is on the remote side. And then I'm going to go ahead and grep for this uh, little special magic here, which is slash F slash zero slash zero slash zero. So that is uh, carriage return or it's uh, carriage forward, I think. And then it's null, null, null. Uh, this is the way that it's kind of not showing you the thing as the user types in. So this is, uh, there's uh, in full disclosure here, there's a lot of info here and you have to kind of dig through to find these passwords. But once again, you'll find that plain text password of the user and, or the, the password, nothing to crack, just full passwords. So be very uh, reticent to log into systems that you know are compromised. Uh, another version of this here. So I was talking about Paramico. Paramico is a full Python implementation of SSH, both the server and the client. So let's say I'm on a system and SSH is not running on that system, but I know that people are logging into things willy nilly or maybe processes are logging into things willy nilly on a network. I can write my own SSH server and then I don't even have to go through the, all that nonsense with strace and digging through log files or anything. So this is uh, the most basic example that I could make of this. And you can make this way more complicated and realistic looking, but uh, for demonstration purposes here, uh, what I'm doing is I have uh, a server interface, which is a Paramico server interface, and I've made my own check auth method here. And this will get called with the username and the password that uh, the the user is trying to log in with and will uh, is responsible for checking that that pass username and password are correct. So uh, the, then I just go ahead and set up a socket. I tell it to listen on port 22, which is the default. Um, I listen for a connection and then kind of just set all of that up and get it ready to go. But the important here is thing here is that check off uh, and that is doing the username and password. What this looks like in practice is you just start the Python server and then anything that tries to log into you, here I just did it as localhost for an example, but you would probably get an IP address from somewhere else. You can see it log in, you can see the username and you can see the password. Uh, so that is a bunch of the fun stuff that you can do with SSH. So just to kind of go over again why SSH is useful. Uh, I get a remote shell to the system that I'm interested in. That's always going to be useful. I can port forward and essentially get to anything else that that system is on the network with and bypass any sort of firewall rules and get around any sort of egress filtering and that kind of stuff. I can download and upload any kind of files that I want. All of those communications are encrypted and pretty hard for defenders to be able to see. And then additionally, people seem to trust SSH a lot and will just log into it. And as you saw, give it their passwords. Um, and the only thing SSH doesn't give me is water and food. Uh, and that is why I think SSH is awesome. Um, it's kind of just the check us out, uh, Randori. We've got our Twitter account for the Randori attack team, um, randori.com careers. We are looking for people that are interested in this kind of stuff. And then uh, our blog, Randori TTPs. Um, and yeah, check it out. Um, and then last, I will leave you with this. Uh, did my webcam make me look fat? Feeling a little out of shape. I've been sitting in my house a long time. So uh, 
Let's make this red team fit. All right. Thanks.